Oh, lovely to see you all. Um, thank you for coming to the film today. Uh, I've just flown in from London where it's hot, or everyone thinks it's hot, it's about 90 and things are stopping working. It's uh, a bit warmer here. Um, I will do my best to answer any questions you have. Um, just a little bit of background on the film. Um, it took around five years to make, from the, from the first idea to, 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 to what you've um, just seen, or to, today, really, pretty much, about five years. Um, it was not an easy film to make, and um, it's, uh, we, we, never, we never thought it would be as, as, as popular as it has been with people, and, and I think everyone involved in the making of it is, is really thrilled. Um, sorry you've only got me today. The, the brothers have been doing a, a crazy press tour themselves, but I can hopefully answer most of the questions relating to them. Um, so, have we got a roving microphone that we can throw it out, or we may have to, to shout questions out, and I will repeat them as best I can. So, yeah. I'll open it up. This lady here. Um, yeah, I, I, when I read the uh, review in the LA Times last week, I was uh, shell shocked um, when I saw the name Peter Neubauer. My mother was his personal assistant for many, many years in New York City. And I'm just wondering, I I think I, I caught in the, it said 19, I'm trying to piece together because I know she had a, fall, a falling out with Peter and left his employ when I was still a young child. I remember playing with Peter's sons. Um, and so I have two questions. The dates of the study, I think it said 1960 to 1980, was that correct? Uh, yeah, so just for everyone, this lady here, her, her mother um, worked with Peter Newbauer a long time ago, um, and uh, you were asking about the dates of the study. Right. Uh, I think, yes, 1960 uh, to 1980 is what we've been told, but then we've also seen other dates which are different to that. It depends where they're written down, and one of the things we found out with the study material being released is that although the, the, the parents stopped the boys being followed, in about 1970, when they said, you know, the, the children have just had enough of this, or they're about 10 years old. But we can, we've seen evidence that they were still following them from afar uh, until the kind of um, late 70s. So, for example, David, as he mentioned in the film, when he was 16 was in, or 15, was in a psychiatric institution briefly, and somehow the scientists got his notes from the psychiatric institution. Um, so they were still keeping notes on them after that. And sorry, your second question? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I was trying to piece together because I, I was wondering whether, my mother never mentioned anything, but she was his assistant, personal secretary and assistant, not a research assistant, but ran his office uh, for many years, and then had a, a falling out and left the scene abruptly. And, I was, and when I read that, I was just wondering whether she left because perhaps she found out about this and couldn't be, couldn't, continue working for him. But my other question was, whatever happened to, do you, do you know anything about the Neubauer family, whatever happened to his two sons? Because I remember playing with them, and one of the kids was pretty wacky, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> and also, when you mentioned about the links to people in high power, um, I remember at a very young child meeting Eleanor Roosevelt who I believe, I don't know whether Peter's wife was related to the Roosevelt family, but or they were very closely connected. And sure, sure. So then just, just um, the lady was asking for sort of additional background on, 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 on Peter. Um, I, yeah, I mean, um, it's certainly true that a lot of people who were around at that time, there were dissenting voices. We know that, for example, there were social workers at the adoption agency who refused to have anything to do with the study. So there were people who you know, disagreed. I don't know if they were sort of moved on or, or, or how that works. Um, and in terms of Peter Newbauer, it's worth mentioning, you know, my intention with this film wasn't to make a film that said, these are evil people who did this. You know, he, Peter Newbauer was the founding father of child psychiatry in America. He, he, I mean, he's done a huge amount of good for children in the US, as have lots of the people associated with this study. It just happens that they were involved in this one thing that was completely unethical by today's standards and, and to be honest I think by the standards of the time as well because we know that they approached other adoption agencies um, we, we've seen evidence that they approached other adoption agencies who said you can't, you can't split siblings identical siblings up it's just wrong you know even back then um, but I'm really interested in that that sort of 
grey areas of human behaviour and why people do bad things even if they're not necessarily bad people. You know, that, um, Lawrence Wright, who, the journalist in the film, has this phrase, noble cause corruption, by which he, he sort of uses to explain why good people do bad things. And I think a lot was, in the 50s and 60s, there were a lot of science, psychology science experiments that were on the edges of, of what we consider ethical, uh, e what would have been considered ethical even then. Um, did you run into anybody who compared this to what the Nazis did with the twins? So the, 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 the Nazi parallel is there. I mean, the, the central irony for me was that Peter Neubauer's family fled, fled the Holocaust from Austria, and so did David's family, and they ended up on either sides of this um, experiment. I, I'm not Jewish, but um, my wife is Jewish, and I have a lot of Jewish friends who find watching the film incredibly hard because of the parallels with Mengele, uh, and, and the Holocaust more, more, more generally in sort of human I I exploitation and experimentation. Um, I think those parallels are absolutely there and I wanted to, you know, that um, David's aunt Hedy kind of alludes to the Holocaust in the film, but I wanted to also feel universal. So I, I wanted to acknowledge that those parallels were there, but, but not kind of spend too much time going down a, a rabbit hole on that. The lady there in the middle. Thank you. So it didn't seem like there was really any um, purposeful attention paid to the biological mother. It seemed to be kind of a pushing away of wanting to explore that further with the triplets beyond kind of a brief conversation and no mention of the biological father. So, so I'm about a question about the biological mother and the biological father. Um, the biological mother, because she's passed away, we, we didn't really... <laughs> And, and she wasn't a huge part of their lives. We didn't really focus on that. The biological father, they did find their biological father. Uh, they managed to persuade their mother to give up his name. Uh, my understanding is they turned up pretty much on his doorstep. He didn't even know that she was pregnant. Um, because it was obviously it was just a one night thing and she never told him. And so they knocked on his door and he opened it. And he, he obviously knew the story of the triplets. And he sort of thought, why are you on the doorstep? And they're like, oh, we're your, we're your son. <laughs> so he was a bit of a shock. Uh, and, and, and then he had a son, subsequently had another relationship, had a son who turned up and was like, Dad, who are these guys? And he had to kind of explain. So, but again, they didn't really, even less so than with their birth mother, they didn't have a close relationship with him at all. Were the three female adopted siblings cooperative with the filming? And what was their comment and their relationship with their parents, retrospectively? This is a good question. It's about the um, uh, sibling, uh, the, uh, the sisters, the adopted sisters. Um, they were cooperative with the filming. Uh, we, it's just a time thing, to be honest. Um, uh, and possibly slightly how we frame the film. People think um, maybe they were more involved in the experiment than they were. My understanding is they were purely there as kind of, they were adopted normally by these families. And then when the, when the scientists and the adoption agency came to do the experiments, then they, they were looking, when they were looking for intelligence on which families to place these boys into, they, that's how they knew because of the sisters. So when we, sort of the revelations in the film, I think the thing that was surprising to the sisters and the families wasn't that the sisters were in some way involved because they always sort of suspected they were. It was just too much of a coincidence. They were all the same age. Um, it was that the, the focus was on the parents as much as it was the children. I think they were all really shocked by that. They never really, they, They'd sort of seen the scientists observing the parents peripherally, but didn't realise there was such a central part of it. Um, the guy at the back in the yellow uh, with the cap. <laughs> Could you speak up a little bit, please? Whenever I up in the doctor, the psychiatrist, man, he suffered from maybe from the Stockholm syndrome that the Nazis one of the twins mentions in the story itself is that what's going on not if you bring it up it's brought up by this audience and I think the doctor you know these fans of credentials and the church woman who worked with him in the Ohio really did a disservice due to humanity and to the Jewish community as a Jew myself these, this kind of act of find Jewish brilliant people the then brilliant people Perhaps in some biggest jerks in the world. You know, and that's that's my personal essence. You know, the Jewish people who see this film 
you know, reacting with similar kind of Absolutely. I mean, he, he was just commenting that um, two things. One was to say that, you know, maybe uh, Neubauer, the, the um, scientist, was in some way, there was some element of sort of Stockholm home syndrome or some unconscious kind of um, playing out of, of what, what happened in the Holocaust. He was sort of repeating that pattern, which is a comment I've heard before and I think is a valid one. Uh, it's not one that I necessarily agree with, but I think it's an interesting interpretation. But beyond that, the gentleman was just talking about how, as a Jewish person, he feels, you know, very strongly about what was that what was done was wrong. And again, I can only reiterate, you know, as I said, my, my wife, sh sh her reaction is when she watches it, Jewish people don't do this kind of thing to other Jewish people, particularly because of the legacy of the Holocaust and how Jewish people have been treated over the years. Just the gentleman behind you the, in the black t-shirt. Thank you. Uh, can you speak a little bit about your relationship to the film and how you became involved in it? Did you seek out the brothers or vice versa? I'm a little bit of that backstory. So, so how I came across this story, I was working uh, as the ideas guy for a company called Raw. They make uh, they made a documentary called The Imposter. Some of you may have seen a few years back, and there's a, a film in the cinema at the moment called American Animals. And so I was sitting in the office, and I was kind of like a, you know, I get hundreds of ideas across my desk every day, and I. I, I you get very cynical, you sort of feel like you've seen everything, but when this idea was brought in by a producer, instantly I thought, this is this is the greatest idea I've ever, I actually thought, I thought she was exaggerating, I couldn't believe it was true, and I couldn't believe that I hadn't heard about it. So from that point on, I was completely hooked. The second thing I thought was, why has no one told this story before? And quite quickly we discovered that various people had tried to tell it before. Um, it became quickly apparent there were three attempts by major US networks, two in the 80s, one in the 90s, and all of them were shut down. But we spoke to a New York Times investigative reporter, who still works for New York Times, who's won three Pulitzer Prizes. He had made a documentary about this story, and about not specifically the triplets, but about this story in the mid 90s for a big network, had basically got to the end of the edit, was all ready to go, and it was pulled. He was never given a reason why not. So making it the whole way through, we were pretty paranoid. Um, and I, part, part of making it, part of the job that myself and the producer had to do was just to sort of calm our, ourselves down the whole time and make, 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 not let ourselves get paranoid. In terms of the relationship with the brothers, it took a long, long time to win them round and get them on side. Um, when you see the film, you see what they've been through, it's not surprising really um, that they find it hard to trust people. And to be honest, until we actually showed them the final film, I don't think they, they fully trusted us. Um, and the reaction we had from showing the film was incredible. I showed it to them separately. And it wasn't just that they liked the film, which they did, which was fantastic. It was that there was a sense that they were very emotional. They kind of come over hugged me. And it was like, you, you did what you said you were going to do. And I think that hasn't happened to them a lot in their lives. So that was quite an emotional experience. Lady over here. My parents adopted a baby boy from Louise Wise Services in 1964. He's my older brother and is uh, definitely mentally, severely mentally ill. Mm -hmm. um, and to the extent that this was talked about in this film, and especially the Lance Wright's um, conversation about the powers that be and what you're saying about how much there have been stops along the way and people making sure this doesn't come out. Um, we've tried a million different ways to get our story told, impossible to do. And there have been many other stories that have leaked out, the Juman story, the Roth story, I'm sure you're familiar with them. Um, is it clear to you and to the other people that that really was what was behind all of this that they were looking at? Is mental so the question from the lady who's, who's got a brother who's adopted from uh, Louise Wise Services about mental health, about the focus of the study, thank you for your question. You'd be surprised how many people have come up to me at Q&As who have experience of Louise Wise in some way. Um, I think what is absolutely clear to me is that Louise Wise were behaving over quite a long period of time completely unethically and were, were regularly um, adopting children from mothers who had severe mental health problems and not telling in any way, shape or form the families, giving them any kind of background. They would selectively pick information to give them a kind of best case scenario. They would say their mother is a very intelligent college graduate who speaks five languages and plays the piano. They wouldn't say she spent a lot of her life 
in, in its psychiatric institutions. Um, and, and the reason that Louise Weiss shut down in the 90s was because they were being sued by so many families. Um, in terms of the mental health angle, it's very hard to tell. I personally, from what I've learned, I don't think that was a primary focus of the experiments. Um, I think that they, from the notes I've seen, that they noticed that there were mental health issues developing amongst a lot of the children that were part of this study, and that they maybe then started to look at them a bit, and there's certainly notes um, in the uh, archives of Viola Bernard, who was the chief psychiatric officer for Louise Wise, that show her looking at mental health and heredity. But I don't think it was, it definitely wasn't, as far as I can see, the purpose in any way of the experiment. But it's certainly true that a lot of people adopted from Louise Wise did go on to experience mental health issues, including the drivers. Was Louise Wise paid for uh, allowing these scientists to have this access? So the question is, was Louise Wise paid for allowing the scientists to have, have access? Um, it, again, it's very hard to say. The finances are very murky, and you have things like the lady I mentioned, Viola Bernard, who's this chief psychiatric consultant who is best friends with Neubauer. She's, she's at Louise Wise. Neubauer's running this study out of a place called the Child Development Centre. She's putting money in, I mean, she was independently very wealthy, putting money into the study, even though she's involved in supplying children to, to the study. What is definitely true is that Louise Wise Services charged parents a huge amount of money for uh, children that they provided for, for adoptive children. Um, it was, you know, it was an elite agency in New York at a time when it was very, very hard if you were a Jewish family to adopt a Jewish child. They had a monopoly. If you were upper middle class or middle class, that was where you went to get a child, and they charged you quite a bit of money for that. Gentlemen, over there. There was a, at the Yale, they were going through the screen and it said, this is a, a box on child six, seven, eight. Do you have an idea of how many children were actually involved in this? So the gentleman's asking, do we have an idea of how many children were part of this? Um, no, it's, it's very hard to tell. We've had different numbers quoted. Um, I've heard from 13 to 21, may even be more than that. Um, for example, the, the sisters that you see, my understanding is they were split up for the study, but then because one of their birth weights dropped during the adoption process, they were then dropped from the study. So they were split up and never studied, um, or only studied for a couple of months. And so there may be other children like that as well. It's very, very hard to tell. And different people you speak to will tell you, Natasha, the Josephowitz, new about assistance, gave me a figure of 21, I think. Other people, different different figures. So it's, it's, it's really, really hard to tell. And it's also the, the Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services, who are the people who control access to the materials, have not been particularly helpful or forthcoming. So the, the, we know of a, one twin pair uh, called Doug and Howie, who found each other in the uh, mid-2000s. And they uh, approached uh, the Jewish Board and said, can we just confirm, were we part of this study? Um, and they said, no, absolutely, you weren't, don't worry, don't worry about it. And then Doug and Howard went away and contacted Lawrence Perlman, who's the scientist you see at the end of the film, and he had notes on them. He'd been in their house studying them as part of the study. So then they went back to the Jewish board and said, well, we have notes that prove we were. And they were like, oh, oh yeah, you were, actually. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, it's, it's impossible to say. I don't, it's not, I don't think it's a vast number, but I certainly think it's probably more than we know about. Did you want to ask that lady right at the back there? Yeah, waving. Thank you. What is the relationship between the brothers now? That's a good question. Uh, she's asking what's the relationship between the brothers now. Um, better than it was. When we were filming, they weren't speaking really. And the, the awkwardness you see in the interview between them is, is, is very real um, and was a real problem when we were making the film. Um, at Sundance, when the film premiered, they were asked that question by the, someone in the audience, and they said it's a work in progress, but the, the process of making the film and showing it, and sharing it with people has brought them uh, closer together. And actually, the lovely thing that it's done is um, their kids, so they all have, all have a daughter. Uh, Eddie's got a daughter, and uh, David's got two, Bob's got one. They're all in their early 20s, and because the brothers hadn't really been getting on, they hadn't spent much time together at all, and since the film's happened, they've hung out a lot more. And uh, one of them said to me, you know like the bit where the, the aunt says at the beginning, it was like puppies wrestling on the floor. 
she said to me, that that's what it's like for them. Because they're, although they're cousins, biologically they're the equivalent of half-sisters because their, their fathers are genetically identical. Thank you over there with the phone. Yeah, I'm interested from the filmmaker's um, standpoint. Was there, uh, did you already know the conclusion when you started this film, or were there, was there an element of discovery, and how did you, how did the filmmaker handle that? They discovered new information. So the lady's just asking about um, how much we knew up front. Um, we knew about, I'd say, 50 to 60 percent of the story, most of the backstory, but really didn't know where it was going to go or who we were going to find. I mean, hardly anyone would talk to us um, from the from the experiment side. We really didn't know we were going to get anyone. Um, and things were still. I mean, the fact that my producer, working with the brothers, managed to get access to some of the records from Yale at the end, and literally the reason those. Um, those uh, videos you see uh, are at the end of the film because we got them right at the very end, literally the last day of the edit. Um, but the, in answer to the question, we're still discovering stuff. I mean, one of the things that I found out recently from the documents is that Eddie was adopted by another family before he ended up with the Gallon. So it was a failed adoption. So he was adopted for like four weeks, five weeks by another family and then given back. Um, so, you, you know, things like that put a whole new slant on it when you, when you find them out. Lady in the middle at the back there? So, is there any way to force them to release the names of the other participants so that they can actually meet each other if they're still alive? So, the lady's asking, is there any way to identify the, the outstanding um, siblings? Not as far as I'm aware. I mean, the, the Jewish board have recently reached out uh, in a sort of PR -y way, in my opinion, to the brothers and sent them a letter saying, we really apologize for. For stuff. We realise now that's a really bad thing we're involved in. Um, and, um, um, they, would only, they wouldn't communicate with us when we were making the film at all. We, they, they, they had a crisis management PR firm who were also representing the, the White House at the time, who were sort of like that. And, and the brothers, they would deal with the brothers with a, um, they had a medical malpractice attorney that would deal with the brothers, so you can sort of get a sense. But anyway, since the film's come out and they've realised that people are talking about it, they've sort of made efforts. Um, and they claim to the brothers that the outstanding uh, siblings that haven't found each other have found each other. They're aware of it via social media, um, but have provided no proof of this. And to be honest, my faith in them is not particularly like, <laughs> high at the moment. Um, I, I, in the Jewish world's defense, what they say is, it dates protection and it's not our place to go out and approach these people in their 50s and 60s and say, oh, you've got a sibling who may have predeceased you that you didn't know about. Um, so they would, they would, they say they wouldn't proactively go out. They would say if people contact them for confirmation, they would confirm it. But again, as I said, we, we know there are examples in the past where they haven't done this. So it's, it's, it's very hard. And Yale, um, I, I feel Yale yeah, are kind of blameless in the whole situation. They're just they're like a, almost like a safety deposit box. Someone said, "Here, you have these files. Here are the conditions on it. It's not in their power to kind of change those rules." Gentlemen, uh, I loved it. I was floored and very excited to see it. Um, I, 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 see, my question's vanishing. I'm nervous. Sorry. Um, the, the 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 current zeitgeist with children being separated from their parents. I think is really lending to your marketing, as horrible as that comparison may be. Uh, it really makes it palpable. Um, but my question is, in how you you kind of brilliantly hid Eddie's suicide so well for so long, and I was curious. Uh, uh, you know, the fact that they were twins and we couldn't identify which was which. You know, in varying photos and the confusion of us not, you know, where's Eddie? Have we heard from Eddie? Uh, uh, <laughs> I guess my question is, uh, the, the fact that his suicide isn't, you can't really explain it, so how did you walk that line of using his death as a, as a device uh, without crossing any lines? Thank you. It's a really good question uh, about um, Eddie's um, this, uh, absence from the film and, and his suicide and how, how we use that in the film. Um, and and, and your, your, your point about children being separated from their parents um, it, it is one that's been brought up a few times. I mean, I, I've been out in America for a year now. I've, I, although I have family here, I haven't spent a lot of time in America. 
before, and I've really fallen in love with the country and seeing some of the stuff that's been going on in the last, you know, six months or whatever, it's been horrific. But um, in terms of uh, Eddie's death, very early on we had a, had a big debate about it, and was whether, at one point we were going to acknowledge right at the top of the film, you know, Eddie isn't here because he's, he's passed away. Uh, and we sort of felt that was, we realised that was unnecessary. I didn't mean to put it, I, I don't mean it to be like a narrative hook or a, or a kind of device or anything like that. I just, I only wanted, to, I'm trying to reveal information in probably chronological order. Um, we didn't know, what's interesting is I'd say 50% of people who watch the film know that they notice he's not there and go, oh, this is good, something must have happened to him, and so they're wondering what's happened. And 50% of the people, or probably slightly more actually, don't even notice because there are so many characters in the film. Um, the suicide was really hard. It's really hard to, um, you know, I've, I've experienced a, a, a people close to me um, committing suicide. And I think I'm very wary of trying to ascribe blame or easy answers because ultimately the truth is, well, they say to me, it's the ultimate irrational act. You know, you can't explain suicide. It's a combination of factors and people normally not in the right frame of mind when they when they take their own lives. Um, but yeah, we have to be really, really sensitive about that. Um, lady here. Well, this is going to a totally different place, but um, when, when you said that, that Eddie had been taken out of the home at, what, four months old? Or I think it was six months. I think five. He was the first, Eddie was the first of the three to do that. that was the first sign that there was some disturbance there. Yeah, 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 the lady's asking about um, Eddie and the disturbance early on. I mean, I, 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 I couldn't say what, what effect that's had, but it, but it clearly, I mean, it, being separated from your brothers who you've been in the womb and in a crib with, and then taken away to another family who then hand you back, so and your brothers have disappeared. If, if you know what the reason was. I don't, I don't know what the reason was. Um, that isn't that isn't in the notes that I've seen. It may exist somewhere, um, but yeah, no, it didn't have any more detail. So, okay, one more. This gentleman here. Congratulations on making something great. Really great. One of the things that it does to take off on the comment that was made and your comment is it is a blistering indictment on the American government's current policy of forcibly separating children which couldn't have been in your mind when you started to do it. So congratulations and thank you for that. My, my granular question is this. You know that um, woman that was filmed in La Jolla and then she went to Switzerland? What was the story about how she knew all of these people at the very, very top of the U.S. government? Do, do you have any uh, So this is a good question about the lady in La Jolla, Natasha Giuseppowitz. Um, uh, Natasha is one of the more extraordinary people I've ever met in my life. Um, she's in this apartment in the Hoya with millions of pounds worth of, tens of millions of dollars worth of uh, art antiquities. And uh, I think she, she just has always moved in those circles, in the kind of elite circles, um, been involved in politics. I don't know exactly what her family background is. I know that she was married. Her first husband was one of the foremost collectors in the world. So she has all these incredible antiquities in her house. Um, I'm not an art expert, but my um, DOP kept going, that one's worth 30 million. That's <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, I, I love the offhand way she's like, Picasso, like that. Um, and something, you know, the list of photos that she shows, there, there was an extended version of that which goes on and on and on. This is me with the King of Siam, this is, you know. Um, I, I, I think she just moved, moved in those circles, and I think, you know, her and Peter and, and various people were part of this kind of uh, intellectual elite of group of people who, 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 who consider themselves incredibly liberal and that's why that sequence is in there having her with um, you know the Obamas and everyone because these people are, they're not they're not right wing or anything like that they consider themselves really right on decent people and that's I think what makes it even more fascinating that they were involved in this um, but yeah but listen I'm sorry I can't I don't have more time thank you all for coming so much <laughs>